Okay, thank you so much. Um, well, my name is Thomas Hooker, and I am the Vice President of Marketing at CollabNet. So before you get too scared about that title, uh, I've been in the software business for about 30 years now. Uh, did my undergraduate work at the university and got a degree in comp sci and uh, left uh, school and went to work for a big bank uh, writing software. Uh, I left that job after a while and you know, really got into the software development side of the house. I've worked for companies such as uh, Bull & Babbage, BMC, Title Software, Cisco, uh, now CollabNet. So I've been involved in most aspects of writing commercial software from being the actual coder, just writing the code, to uh, product management, um, product marketing, uh, development management and uh, just pure play marketing and the role I have now. So my first question I'm going to have is who here is familiar with the term value stream management, value stream mapping? You've heard of it. So maybe about a fourth of the audience. So we'll delve a little bit into that and why you should care about it and what it could mean for you going forward. So my goal for the session, you know, frankly, everyone, is to pique your interests enough that you decide to go to my website, stop by and see us at the booth. I have one of my senior uh, technical leaders in Europe uh, at this event with myself. Uh, would be happy to schedule more in depth detail because when it comes to value stream management, it becomes very much about yourselves and what you guys are doing and how you're articulating that value back to your business. So everybody has, as we'll see, different tool chains, different needs, uh, different desires, and different responsibilities of reporting that all make themselves present in value stream management. First off, just a little bit about CollabNet. Uh, We've been a leader in open source-based application, lifecycle management, enterprise version control and collaboration for about almost 20 years now, I guess. Uh, we're headquartered in South San Francisco, just uh, south of the city. Uh, we have about 10,000 customers. Now, a little bit about those 10,000 customers. Those 10,000 customers uh, have a lot to do with that piece that says leader in open source. We have a lot of stuff we give away for free. Has anybody committed code to subversion before? That was a CollabNet invention. Uh, that was the first thing we ever really commercialized and brought to market was the subversion enterprise version control system. We personally now actually internally in our development really use Git more than subversion. We still support subversion, uh, absolutely. We give it away for free on our website. Um, but uh, that's where those 10,000 customers come from. We have a, another set of customers that pay us for our platforms. And we have enterprise version control platforms, we have application lifecycle management platforms, ARA solutions, as well as the, the product I'm gonna talk most about today is the DevOps lifecycle manager. Um, the large of our, largest of our customers is about 80,000 users. Uh, they do use this solution, it is our ALM solution, and they do use that solution hosted. We host that for them. Uh, our customers are split about 50-50 right now. About half of them are running on-prem solutions of ours. About half of them are running cloud-based solutions that we provide for them. And we have about 249 employees around the world. Our biggest facility in Europe is actually in Berlin. That's the headquarters of our uh, enterprise version control solution is built in Berlin. We have a large office in Chennai, India a large development facility in Houston, Texas, as well as San Francisco, and are scattered with support and sales offices throughout the globe. So let's, uh, before we get a little bit into value stream management, let's talk about some of the trends that have been and will continue to drive the world we live in. Uh, on the far side of the screen here, you see that software is consuming the world. Uh, Mark Andreessen famously wrote an article back in the Wall Street Journal that software is going to eat the world. Uh, since then, we've seen that become true. Uh, as you can see, uh, the uh, beloved leader of Microsoft let us know that everybody is going to have to become a software business. It doesn't matter what you do today, you're gonna have to learn software. Uh, Adrian Bridgewater kind of followed up the software eating the world with a piece a couple years back in Forbes magazine about open source. 
And this is a really a unique uh, change that's only 10 years old. About seven years ago, I was at a company, and we actually sold that company to Cisco. And one of the things that we had to do before we could complete that acquisition, and did this all the time back in the Valley, is we had to go through all of our source code, and we had to prove that we didn't have any open source in it, because that was always an IP issue back in the day. So we were very concerned about the licensing of open source. <laughs> is your commercial product not really your IP? Now we embrace uh, open source, and that's typically how we get started. You start your development efforts typically by figuring out what you can go grab. It's very much like marketing. So like there's only one PowerPoint slide in the whole world, and everything's been just a, a version of that slide that started. So we all just keep reusing and reusing. Same's true with software. And of course now you can see Mark Andreessen has followed this up with software is going to program the world. Everything is becoming that as code. Something as code is the buzzword of today. Over here on the right-hand side of the screen, you can see Gartner is telling us how digital uh, business is software. J.P. Morgan, the bank, I know we have a lot of representatives from J.P. Morgan here, but making the quote from your CIO, I have more developers in Microsoft or Google, because that's what my business is now. It's a digital presence. And of course, uh, the CEO of uh, General Electric, the venerable General Electric Corporation, really built to build hardwired technology is every company has to become a software company. We have to embed smarts into the world, and that's what we're doing increasingly. But there's another change that's really starting to take place, and this is a really good change and a really good change for people writing software, and that's the customer. There was a time that this gentleman who made a fortune at one time, you see his product still, driving around the streets of London, dictated what you would get. This is Henry Ford telling you, you can get any car you want as long as you want it black, otherwise you're not gonna get the car. I'm gonna dictate what you get. That was the power companies had just 100 years ago. They built things, people bought them. That has dramatically changed. Here is another fairly successful people person. Anybody here stream music or sports or anything? He was the guy that kind of started it all. Uh, Mark Cuban, he had a little company he founded that he sold to Yahoo. It was all about streaming live sports on the internet because he wanted to listen to basketball games of the college he went to school at. Uh, made himself a fortune doing that. But as he's telling us here, make your products easier to buy than your competition or your customer will go someplace else because customers have choice and they increasingly use that choice. They vote and it has increasingly become a customer-driven marketplace. Customers have never been more empowered than they are today to make change. You get an app, you don't like it, you delete it, you get the next one. That's just the way the world works. If the bank you bank with doesn't let you take a picture of the check to deposit it, you get a new bank. That's simply the way it is. It's telling us that brand loyalty has gone away. Brand loyalty has really become experience loyalty, and my loyalty to you is as good as the last experience I had. Oftentimes, those experiences take place with no person being there. So the quality and the functionality of our software is more important than ever. Who has recently checked into a hotel room by getting an email, walking straight to your room, and opening the door with your phone? That's the way we go into rooms now in hotels increasingly. It's the software interface that defines that experience. And it will continue to be that way. So across industries and products, software is becoming that defining characteristic of that product. Has anybody recently bought a car? Anybody bought a car recently? We bought one recently. We bought a little Honda Fit, nice little gas mileage car. You know, the most expensive feature on that car to add into the car was what in the automobile industry they call the head unit. That's the center console that the stereo plugs into, the entertainment streams into, your phone connects to. It used to be you wanted the leather seats or the nice wheels or the big engine. Now it's the digital presence inside the car. It's software defining that car for you is in becoming increasingly, increasingly important. How important is that? Ford recently just announced the Ford that would only give you a car in black. 
they're going to produce a car with no CD player anymore because the car is aimed at the millennial generation. They all stream. They don't own CDs. They don't want to plug their music in. They want to stream their music. Software, once again, driving that interface. And it's good business for us to make the customer happy adds to the bottom line. And this really starts to get into this concept of value stream management. As we do these changes, as we innovate through software and we improve the customer experience, how do we measure that it actually happened? How do we know that feature that got committed actually did something that drove the bottom line? That's where value stream management starts to come into play. That's where we start to measure what we did and what it meant to the customer and the business. So we've learned to move faster and innovate quicker. When I, you know, as I said, I, when I graduated college and started writing software, we maybe had a release, I don't know, someplace between every quarter and every half year was kind of our release cycle. It's kind of a, what we now call waterfall. Now we have companies, you go to you talk to a company like Netflix, they release over 100 production times, 100 times into production a day. But is the business satisfied? Apparently not from this um, Forrester survey. That the business, even as quickly as we've gotten, the business still doesn't think we're delivering new features or changes to customer-facing applications fast enough. The business wants more because they're under an intense pressure to deliver more. And the question becomes increasingly to us, regardless of the business you're in, will you be disrupted by all of this? Will the customer disrupt you? Will the technology disrupt you? And what we would say, it's not really a matter of if you're going to be disrupted. It's really a matter of are you ready and what side of the equation are you going to sit on? Are you going to be a disrupted company or are you going to be a disruptor? It's going to be one or the other. So you better pick which side you want to be. I have a very good friend, and I couldn't have noticed when I was looking out one of the windows here, one of the buildings here has a state flag of Texas flying, and I thought that was interesting in downtown London. But uh, my good friend, what she would say to you is, is a Texas expression, the only thing in the middle of the road is a yellow line and dead animals. So decide where you want to be and get there. Uh, you can see here that most of these industries uh, have been or will continue to undergo disruption. And one of the ways you will know that if you're working for a company that is a disruptor is how do they operate? Because digital disruptors tend to work like software companies. They innovate like software companies. So if we were to look at a traditional vendor, Ford, as opposed to the software-defined vendor, Tesla, and the way that the software in a Tesla, if you've ever been in one, if you own one, is not added into the car. The car is basically built around the software. It is a very nice set of sheet metal that surrounds the digital presence you drive with. If you drive on a freeway, it's actually pretty cool in the Bay Area because it does literally drive itself. It's pretty... It's it's, you know, it's going to be an hour and a half that you don't have to pay 100% you know, uh, attention to the wheel when it will drive itself, it will censor itself, it will try to change lanes if it wants to, it will slow down, speed up uh, in that uh, 30 miles, hour and a half drive to get me to uh, my house in Pleasanton from the city. Home entertainment used to be the network told you what you would watch and when it was going to be on. Now you stream it. You watch what you want to watch when you want to watch. And the networks have caught on. Most of them all now have on-demand features for the programming as well. But you increasingly decide what you're going to watch and when you're going to watch it. It's not by the company deciding. We talked about uh, hospitality, Airbnb. Why should I go to Hilton when I can just come stay at someone's house? It will give me a tour of the city as well. Once again, a software-driven business. Here's uh, one that I actually pulled the last time I was uh, in London on British home stores uh, going out of business. 100-year-old business, no more. Because did you really need those sheets today? Because if you didn't, Amazon will ship them to you in two days. <laughs> and they'll take them back if they didn't work. 
very convenient. It's all about, once again, this customer-driven um, uh, experience. The last one doesn't as fly as, uh, really apply as much into this city, quite honestly, because this is like one of two or three cities I, I ever go to that actually has taxi drivers that know where they're going, can actually take you someplace. You try to catch a cab in San Francisco, the first question they're going to ask you is, where do you want to go? The second question the driver will ask you is, how do you get there? Because they won't know. So you'll have to tell them. So Uber, which is headquartered in the city, that's really part of how they came up with the idea, is that you have local people that actually know where you're going to go, but once again, no cash involved, very no fuss, no muss, digitally driven business. So the disruptors operate like software vendors. The disrupted companies do not, and they get overtaken. So this quest for speed has really taken us down two paths. One is Agile. Anybody uh, not adopted Agile in their business? Is there any business, anybody that's not adopted Agile? That's good. That's kind of what we would expect it right now because most people have. Um, the next really task is we went to this DevOps thing. So what we've started to do here is cycle the software faster and faster and faster. And how can we do this and how can we do it faster? But the truth of the matter is that's not really what we do. What we really do, and actually uh, I had one of the gentlemen at um, Colin Fletcher from Gartner give me the idea for this. It's not a tool chain or a value stream, it's multiples. Because we've empowered the developers to choose what they want to do when they want to do it. So what we've done is we've created a environment in which case each team kind of produces and chooses a set of tools they want to use, and they use those tools to build their software fastly, very, very quickly. So what we end up having is multiple tool chains running in the business at one time. So we start to have this challenge of how do we measure all of this? How do we understand the value? How do we compare team A to team B? Who's doing better? Who's not doing better? How do we do all of this? That's where value stream management really starts to come into play. How do we measure the value of that work stream? Before I go to this slide real quick, does anybody that is familiar with value stream management know where it came from? OK, well, just quickly, uh, the value stream management term really comes out of lean manufacturing and was really a construct developed by Toyota Motor Corporation originally. And the reason they did it, the first known example of a value stream drawing was actually Toyota showing their suppliers the role they played in their manufacturing facilities. So as they started to use suppliers more and more to deliver key components of the automobile, they needed those suppliers to have the ability to understand the role they played in the manufacturing of the car, the value they produce of the overall stream that instantiated itself at the very end of the production line as an automobile. So this slide actually came from one of our customers, uh, someone we've partnered with a lot in the entertainment uh, sector. When he started to describe to us what they call the five C's of DevOps. So I've asked him and he lets me use this slide of his kind of concepts on this. And the key thing here is really the continuous word, that it never stops. We're always doing the integration, we're always doing the planning, we're always doing the testing, the feedback, the monitoring. It is a continual process like that, a little uh, figure eight drawing in the previous slide, always cycling through and through and through. And as we do this, and we do this at speed, we start to run into this one fundamental challenge that brings us to the value stream question, which is how do you measure it all? How do you actually understand where the value is being produced, where the bottlenecks exist? This becomes extremely challenging because we no longer have the single platform that you look at. This is a single thing. We now have multiple instantiations of this, so how do we actually do that? Because what do the enterprises really want? Well, the first thing to understand is Everybody has a different need or a different want of what they want to do. I've just highlighted four here. Executives want to know, what did I get from that? If you go talk to a line of business leader, typically when they talk about value, they start really talking about revenue. Are we producing revenue? Are we obtaining more customers? Are those customers buying more things? Are they buying more products from us? 
we start to talk about uh, the developer, you know, was it on time? Are there any issues? Engineering's IT. So really what this shows you is everybody in the tool chain kind of has a different need and desire that they want out of it. By and large, when we talk about development, we typically are talking about innovation. And we're typically oftentimes measured by how we innovate. We might even have KPIs and bonus performance indicators for ourselves based on innovation. When you go over and you walk a little bit more into the QA side of the world, it's not really innovation. It's really more about quality. Is this quality and how are we going to measure quality? So is this thing, before I release it, is it high quality code? In our world, I remember when I was a development manager, we never held the trigger for the release. The trigger for the release was held by the QA manager. He, only, he and only he could release the software to production. We could recommend, we could say it's code complete, we could go over a point system of how many points are on the release and no sev ones and no install issues, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. At the end of the day, it was the QA manager's job to pronounce it ready to release. And then, of course, when you get all the way over to operations, what does the operations uh, leader really care about? Stability. Uh, anybody here working in the operations side of the house? And what's a good day in operations? There you go. The phone doesn't ring, does it? That's a good day. So this innovation that all these software guys are doing and throwing over the fence, you know, that's a bad day is when the phone starts ringing because I, how people call and send their love lots? Probably not, right? Exactly. So we have different ways that we want to look at the world, and that's one of the things value stream management allows you to start doing on that. So this thing called value stream management, where is it in its life cycle, and what's it really about? So this is a quote from Forrester uh, I, I pulled out, uh, and I think the important thing I underlined there is measuring business value. How are we associating business value to what we're doing? And I've kind of circled value stream management right here in the lower corner to let you know where it is in its overall life cycle and where does it sit with other things you might be familiar with. Like continuous integration is really considered to be at an equilibrium and most people get the concept, most people are probably using the concept. Uh, release automation, now that we can build things faster, how are we actually picking those things up and releasing those into production as we've started to produce software in smaller and smaller chunks and release it faster and faster, we can't really rely on our old manual scripts anymore, right? We need an automated tool that can manage that pipeline, can roll it forward and roll it back so our friends in operations can have a good line of sight and a rollback ability. So you can see when it comes to value stream management of this concept within software, it's really now just getting, uh, getting started. But I do believe you're gonna start hearing a lot more about it. Uh, it does seem to be a term that you'll see more from Forrester than you will Gartner, because Forrester and Gartner are like uh, pretty much kind of like oil and, and water. Gartner will come up with this different term because they, they just can't share the same term. They don't, they don't do that. Uh, and I'm sure they're, they're busily doing, uh, doing that right now. But this is kind of where it sits in the life cycle. So you can see from this that we're really looking at it to start to understand its movement in the next three to five years as it progresses on the, uh, on the chart above. So why do we want this in the DevOps world? Well, as I said, it came from lean manufacturing. It's really designed to help us, if it's really designed to help us do anything, it's about improving. How do we continually improve and measure what we're doing to get to where we want to go? Uh, it provides you an understanding of the deep value that is in each of the steps and the stream as an example, uh, the whole stream as an example, and it helps us identify where to focus on. There's no sense improving a process that's downstream if that's not where the bottleneck is. You're not gonna speed anything up, you're not gonna improve quality. So where's the hot spot in the development cycle? Where should I go focus my efforts on? It gives us a current way to do it. And another thing it does also, and it's very nice, actually a, um, a, a woman we were talking to just a few, uh, a few months ago brought this to, uh, to our light is 
she wanted a common set of truths is what she wanted. She wanted a common dashboard that we could all agree upon instead of me showing up with my tools and you showing up with your tools. That's really what she was looking at. When we look at what it can start to do for you, you can see I've broken the uh, development cycle into kind of three big phases here, uh, a build phase, a deploy phase, and a manage phase. And I start to kind of just break it apart and show off here to the, uh, to the right what value stream management can do for you in that release from improving the mean time to recovery or resolution to improving the mean time uh, between failures. I will make these slides available for everybody so uh, you don't have to take notes. Uh, they, will, they will be made available to you through the, uh, through the organizer. But uh, as you can see, very much as the um, workflow goes through its a variety of steps, we start to get the ability to measure what's going on there and to understand did that meet expectations, did that not meet, ex meet expectations, how complete was that thing, and puts a, an ability to see the overall forest across the development process. Um, and that becomes an extremely powerful tool for us. This should look fairly familiar to you. Uh, this is the value stream mapping uh, from plan to ops. These are the basic steps that are uh, highlighted out on the far uh, outsides of this, uh, this chart. We call this the U-chart at, at CollabNet. So you, know, you plan for code, you code yourself, you build it, you push it over to production, it's living in production, you're monitoring it, and then of course as you operate it, you might have a service incident, then you can take things back and you can review it. One of the powerful things you start to get from this is the ability to have continuous feedback. And that's one of the things our DevOps product does. So what I've done in this, uh, this picture right here is I've just thrown up to the far sides some of the tools you might be using in a value stream. But as I said, you typically don't just have one value stream. You have multiple value streams. And that's what I've done here. I've just laid this flat. I've taken the specific tools you had in that chain, and I laid it flat. This in the parlance of CollabNet would represent a value stream. From the planning all the way into the operations phase, these are the tools that, can, that create that, almost like an assembly line you would have in a manufacturing facility, and the work that flows through it is how the value gets created for the business. So that looks fairly, fairly standard, but you know what? Not all customers are like that. Here's one that a lot of our customers have, because we've been in business for a while, so they might have something like SAP thrown in here, but they now want to understand what's the role of SAP in that value chain as we integrate uh, SAP into this overall value stream or work stream that we're actually doing. Really, the magic that I'm going to talk about the rest is the magic of the tool. And as I said, my, my goal here is to have everybody here have a desire to stop in and chat with us afterwards. This is a KPI dashboard that uh, is from our product. And these are little tilettes or little cards that we've done that allow us to look at a series of value streams, that's a service that's being provided by the business, in a common way. So in this one right here, we're looking at a set of metrics and have the ability to compare what we're calling pet store order fulfillment and, cat, uh, and, and service catalog to each other if we want to. Plan to deploy, how many days is it taking from, from getting that original plan to getting it to deploy? What's the deployment frequency? How often are we deploying? Sometimes we're deploying four times a day, sometimes we're deploying up to 32 times a day. If we have a failure right now, what is our mean time to recovery for that? And you can see here, we also have some alerts. Do we have any health activities that is actually an alert we need to look at. So this is when you talk to uh, CollabNet, becomes what we, the way we measure and define a value stream. So now it's time to talk about, yes, I do have a solution, I have a product, and we sell it. Uh, <laughs> we'll be collecting credit cards when you leave. Uh, there's a gentleman back there, his name is Vincent. He's the uh, senior account director uh, in Europe. He'll be happy to help you with that. But the tool really has three real big uh, functionalities it, bling, it, it brings to, uh, to bear on this problem. 
The first thing is this tool chain integration, the ability to look at this integrated tool chain. Um, so when you look at all these tools and you want to see how this affects that, yeah, you could go write a script or buy, uh, maybe buy uh, you know, some tools and build that yourself. Or you could come to CollabNet and we have these adapters and we can integrate through those tool chains. The ability to orchestrate the activities among the, within this tool chain and across these tool chains with live data. So back and forth, we have a rules engine. We can see an event take place. We can have a rule put on that event and go do someplace, something someplace else based on looking at that. And then, of course, the insights and the intelligence, putting the dashboard and providing the insights of what's going on underneath. How well is this actually performing for you? That is kind of the, really the crown jewel of the, what the solution does. It looks something like this. This could be your world right now, some basic steps here, right? Some tools underneath it. You probably have these today, and they have events, and they generate all these events, but these events just kind of go wherever they go. There's no organizing principle behind this unless you go in and do that hard coding yourself to do that. One of the things we bring to bear on this, of course, is a layer to integrate those tools and take those, those events to provide that integration of the events and the traceability across the tool chain. We create this continuous feedback loop. So a uh, really good example of a customer of ours of what they do, uh, and this was actually one I really like a lot. As they go through the process uh, of planning and, and, and building software, they have found through experience that what they actually have happen in their production world is if something's going to fail, the thing that they, they care about most is, is this, it's actually a mobile app that they stream and they collect ad revenue off the mobile app. So if it goes down, they don't get the ad revenue. If it's going to fail when they've done a change, it typically is going to fail in the first 30 minutes of the failure, uh, of the deployment. So what they've actually started to do is, as they release, uh, create the release object and deploy it using their ARA tool, they actually use the IBM tool, uh, Urban Deploy. They have us look at that event for them and automatically go to Splunk and turn on logging and point it at that exact object. Uh, and they turn it up high. And if nothing happens in 30 minutes, they actually turn it off and throw the logs away. If something does happen, they have the logs, they create the service ticket, they grab the logs automatically, and they send it back. And that's pretty cool in itself. But the cooler thing about that actually is the fact that we, through our integration on this layer here, followed that item all the way from the plan. We know what the plan was. We saw the epic. We saw the code commit. So we actually saw what code you committed. And as we say in software, the thing that broke is probably the thing you changed. So when we take the service ticket back, we know what the change was. So that's part of the service ticket that goes back. That, the problem they were solving with this solution was mean time to resolution. That was one of the ways they were able to go to their business and get the investment funds to purchase this solution because outage on a mobile app that streams content that relies on ad revenue, outage means no money. That was mean time to resolution. They were able to use this product and take it back and actually show value to their business for the investment. We, of course, put a dashboard on this. This Git dashboard is highly customizable. It comes with some out of, the, you know, out of the box views for you to have, but it also allows you to customize them the way you want to customize them. Very nice thing, as I said, is your key data in a single view. So it's not our data, it's not what we want to show you, it's what you want to see. Do you want to see deployments over the last eight weeks and how that's trending? Maybe you're more interested in seeing the development cycles. Um, how about cycles to re resolution? Uh, quality metrics. You get to instantiate the data that you want to show to the folks that want to see it. And as we saw earlier uh, in the discussion, different people want to see different things based on the roles they have. But one of the nice things, especially if you're in the operations side of the world, we used to have this thing we'd call a hot site. Whenever uh, operations called a hot site to support desk would call it, we would all have to show up with our, our core team. I'd come with my architects, the QA team would come, and the first thing we would start to do is look at the data 
and everybody had their own tools. So who had the data that was going to be the single source of truth that we're going to use to decide this was it? This helps solve that problem because we all have access to the data because you have tools on the operation side that the developers don't have. And when you give them the data from the tools, oftentimes they don't even know what it really means. That's beyond what they're doing. They have the same thing. What they probably tell my friend in operations is, huh, worked well on my system. Well, yeah, your system's not my system. Maybe it was a system drift issues. But those are the types of things we start to bring to the forefront with this. So you said value stream mapping. Align the DevOps tool chain. So how do you create one of these DevOps tool chain? Within our product, it's a drag and drop. We have the tools that we know are available. You drag the tool down onto the palette, and that's how you start to create the tool chain that you're currently using. So it's not like a scripted, coded, how do we connect this to that? We do that out of the box for you. So it's a very nice uh, innovation feature that we put into this product. Measure and track the pipeline health and the exception. So what is it you want to look at? Once again, customize, and as we do always in systems management or in applications uh, management, look at exceptions. Don't look at things that are going well. Look at the things that aren't going well. A rules engine. As I said earlier, we have the ability to create business rules and mission-critical KPIs with a rules engine that comes with the system. So you have this ability to go in here. You're seeing a series of rules that have been produced with the product when it was modified, what the true enablement would be, what the target and the action would be throughout it. So it's giving you a summary view of the rules that have been created in the tool so you can see what rules are currently active in the system. So when a problem happens, do we solve that problem? No, we don't solve that problem for you. We tell you the problem happened, right? We're going to take you to the tool that you use to solve the problem. So in this example, you can see we're driving down and dropping into a Jenkins console. So you can actually use the tool that you use to create that to solve it. We do not try to replace those tools. And that's one of the hallmarks of what we do as an open source vendor uh, is we do not uh, say, hey, you need to remove that tool, that tool, this tool, and that tool to use my tool. We do make a set of tools. We have a version of Git. You might be using GitHub. We have our own version. We think ours has a lot of superior features to their version. But nonetheless, we understand in, a, in an enterprise environment, rip and replace is not really the way to get things done. We integrate with the tools you have. And when it comes to remediation of that, we drop into those tools. And you use that native tool that you, you would normally be using. Monitor and optimize, once again, looking at the things you want with the analytics. So you can see right here, we're looking at, in this example, pipeline volume, how many commits have been done in this given month, what do we view the health would be, anything in red, as you would think, means there's a problem there, you probably want to look at it, and also giving you a trending line as to what we're doing. In a life cycle stage, so you can see right now, dev to production is currently, for this, for this specific application or service, it's 14 days and it's trending upwards by 1.2% but we're spending longer in dev and it's, we, we, it's, it's decreased by 4.2%. So once again, bringing out the high level information you need to do your job. And then of course, traceability. Once you see an issue, what you're gonna wanna do is drill down and see where that issue exists. So what I'm showing in this one, and I apologize, I keep telling the development team that they really need to make this a bolder looking screen because it's very difficult to see. Right. Yeah. Sorry about that. Um, but really the ability to traceability of the actual work items all the way down through what it did and where the issues might be. And now I think I'm at about five minutes. So I'm gonna go ahead and once again, I've enjoyed your presence. I've got some time for some, I think I got five minutes or so for any questions. I do encourage anybody to stop in and see us. Um, visit with my friends uh, down below, William, uh, key technical resources here. I also see that I have the director of technical management in Europe is here as well. Uh, so questions, anybody? <laughs>